All right, it is uh, time for a very special guest. Michal Hartig is with us this morning. Good morning to you. How are you doing? Good morning. Yeah, it's a little after the morning now in some places. <laughs> <laughs> the secrets of, uh, of um, slightly recorded live internet TV, Michal. Oh, yeah. But um, look, th- when we heard you were coming in, there was one story that I was really hoping that you would... Um, would tell us. I've seen you speak before about the very beginnings of sports broadcasting in Ireland and how the GPO was involved and how Croke Park was involved and I just thought it was a really fascinating story. Well, it goes back to when the, the first radio station was set up in Ireland. It went on the end of the 1st of, uh, 1st of January 1926 and strangely enough the first voice that went out on it was Douglas Hyde even though he wasn't to become really famous until he became the first president of Ireland in 1938. But he was a well-known Gaelic poet. He was from Roscommon, Church of Ireland man, great man for the Irish language. He was the first. I think it went on air maybe for at most three hours a day. And then silence with the rest. Until somebody got an idea. You know, I always, since hearing this story first time, a great believer in listening to ideas. And this man's idea, he was working in the station, not too many working there. And he decided himself, we have equipment that will make it possible on Sunday next to have a man in Croke Park that would talk about the hurling final, semi-final between Galway and Kilkenny. He didn't consult anybody, went out, got his bicycle, cycled up to Croke Park, met whoever was there and told him his idea. And the radio wasn't well known at the time. It was only, you know, since January and this was August. And they said, sure, we'll give it a chance. They didn't believe it would be a big success. So on the following Sunday, the first sports broadcast went out by our, by it was 2RN at the time. And the man chosen to do it was a man called Peter Megan. He was the commentator. A journalist with the Irish Times. He had worked in London for a good few years. He was a good sportsman. He had played football over there and so on. And he was asked to do it. And in his own words, written years later, he had no box, no seat or anything. He was among with the, among the spectators on the sideline. They all had, you know, planks really on concrete blocks. He was among those. And when they got up, he had to get up and push his head around them. But he spoke about what was happening as best he could. And he even said the start was, before the game started, an engineer hung a hardness around my neck. He called it a hardness. And once the referee threw in the ball, he said, fire away. (laughs) And he fired away. Now, the strange thing is, that alone was the first broadcast in Ireland to the first sports event anywhere in the world to go out on live radio. So that was, that was a unique distinction for 2RN. Not a full year in existence, and they had invented sports broadcasting. It's not bad. And see, the industry it has grown to. And whenever I'm abroad and there's a discussion on radio, I, think, I remind them all where sport was brought into it. Because there were radios in other countries for years ahead of 1926. And was it straightforward to get the signal from Croke Park to the I'm GPO? I'm not sure, but they did it. At, yeah. <laughs> they did it, and then, you know, it was so popular that two weeks later when Cork and Tipperary were replaying the Munster final, he was there as well. And the final was broadcast, and football likewise, you know. So that is the start that sports broadcasting had. And as time went on, they added minors to it and juniors things got bigger bigger and better you could say since then when did you get into it i got in 1949 i came to dublin in i would say september 48 attending the teachers training college in drumcondra the all ireland final was on the following sunday and that was our number one and you didn't need a ticket that time you came along and you paid at the styles uh, it wasn't much. In today's terms, was free entrance almost. Yeah. And I was there for that All-Ireland final. Mayo were in it. I've seen a lot of Mayo. They won in 50-51. They were beaten one point by the great Cavan team that won in the polo grounds the year before. And 
was a it was a great occasion, you know. It was a, the windiest day I was ever in Croke Park. For. The wind was with Cavan in the first half. They scored three goals and three points, and Mayo had no score at half time, but they had the wind in the second half, and they narrowed it down and down and down, and with the time nearly up, they were only one point behind, and they did get a free, and it wasn't scored. Now it was uh, maybe on the 14, but it was an angle to the right. And I'd say, you know, scientifically he was right. Mick Higgins was standing on the goal line for Cavan. But he advanced. The rule was 14 yards from the ball. But the 14 yards, as mentioned, you know, straight in. Yeah. Whereas he was at an angle. He maintained he was about 17 yards from the ball. So he moved out and he was in a position to feel the ball that would have gone over the bar. Right. Down the field, the game was over. So the, the Mayo people, the Beaten curse, by before the curse. Point, and they had the same experience many times since, but they did win too. They were a team, they were great characters. I got to know them all. That was one of the privileges of being a sports commentator. You got to know the players, you know. It was easy meeting that and there were no managers to say, oh, don't talk to, uh, don't talk to anybody. It was free and open, I think it was great. And what did uh, Mayo blame in All-Ireland final defeat on before the curse? Well, the curse, they say, came in 51. But prior to 51, obviously this is 48 today. What was their main excuse if they didn't have well, the curse to blame? They had the one, they, were, they had won in 36, and mm. that was the previous one. There was no talk of it. Mm. And there was no talk of it for a long number of years until somebody came up with the possibility. Yeah, <laughs> a reason, a myth. Yeah. And it is still there, then. Anyway. Uh, you, met, you mentioned getting to know the players there, and it's very interesting. Like I, I've read your book uh, from Dune Jean to Croke Park. It's a couple of years now since I've read it, but yeah. uh, the, the one thing that I'll always remember is just talking about your relationship with the Kerry players and the Kerry players who were living in Dublin at the time and oh, actually yes. training them. Yeah, well, I was in Dublin, and you know there were Kerry players in Dublin always that time. A few of them working as civil servants, maybe teachers, and quite a few of them would be attending college. So it wasn't so easy to travel. So we just gathered together different places and uh, what we used to say we'll be kicking around kicking around there were no major tactics but it changed as the year went on and when Mick O'Dwyer took over now I had been doing it before that Mick O'Dwyer and the county chairman got at me would I organise them and have a proper training a camp if you like now we hadn't enough numbers to do it on our own we had maybe six or seven Kerry players but we needed more and we, we were open house to people from any county. Right. We had people from Leitrim that used to come, from Sligo, from Mayo, from different places. And we had we'd a lot from Mayo and we used to have great fun. We'd even train together and they might be playing against each other in the match the following Sunday. That didn't matter. I used to say to them, look... We're all training together. When you go out in the match, you have a job to do, you have a job to do, I have a job to do, and let's all enjoy the whole thing. It is remarkable to think now that um, somebody who's commentating on them would be asked by the county to be involved. Like, it's a, it's, yes. it's a, a privileged... But I knew all those lads, and, you know, the, the selection I had when Mick O'Dwyer came, I mean, I had nearly the best of them. Jack O'Shea, who would rate as one of the best midfielders of all time, he had won a minor in 40 in 75, he had won 321s in a row, and he burst on the scene in 76, the end of 76 he was a senior. Mick Spillane was there, a brother of Pat, and he strangely has more all Ireland medals than Pat. He has 12, and Pat is only 11. <laughs> How did you... Charlie Nelligan and Paddy Mahoney and Ger Power and John O'Keefe. It was a good team. They were, they were all... The Dublin 7 aside team was a pretty good team. Well, they, were, they were a good team. They were all footballers. They were all keen and no, none of them would say, well, now you have no All-Ireland medal, you can't be telling us what to do. Yeah. They would never be that way. Whatever I'd say was the law and... If any of them were ever getting dropped or having a bad game, would you find yourself kind of on the radio going, no, oh, he's playing well, keep him in there? Well, no, I told them, no, we'd, we often travel together to matches, you know. If you was, and I would say, I have a job to do. My job is there are two sets of listeners, or maybe more, the neutrals, the followers of each county. Uh, I have to, they're, 
they're the interesting people once the game started. I am speaking, I'm trying to give as much information about what is happening. That's the advice I just give young commentators. Your duty is to explain what is happening, not what you'd like to see happen. Yeah, but it's hard when you're a human being. It's, I never found it hard. Right, OK. If Jacko kicks and a bad wide, be, you're like, well... It would be the same put as off. a wide by any other person. And, you know, at that time, players used to be told, in the parade, be concentrating, don't, don't ever look up at the stand to see you, you're being admired and all this... A few of them never passed the box without, <laughs> <laughs> and we had we had great fun, really. Yeah, and I would say the greatest fun of all in '83, Kerry were going for nine in a row in Munster, and Jack O'Shea was captain that year, so it was a special year. And early in the year, I said, Jack, now you'll have two speeches to make this year, one in July, Munster final, one in September, all Ireland final. You'll have to learn a bit of Irish. And I started teaching him little bits as we went on from February on, you know. Couldn't you on our And we built it up and we travelled together and pulled aside somewhere on the way down. And I made a mock president. He gave the finest speech I ever <laughs> <laughs> You know, we laughed at it really, but it was fun. Yeah. Went in then and Cork won with a late, a last minute guy. I can remember every move of it. It was a little beyond the 45. Dinny Allen was the kicker. They were a point down. And, you know, they were mm, trying to get a draw at least. And Dinny Allen was a very careful fellow. He was making sure he looked well and fixing himself. And then another player got uneasy. Time is running out. Tyg Healy. And he passed him by and took the free in towards the goal. Tyg Murphy caught it, turned around the back of the net. Final whistle. Corkwood Monster Champions. And the finest speech ever taught or learned was never delivered. <laughs> But the strange thing is, Kerry forbot, forgot to bring the cup with them. <laughs> right. They, was, they were so confident they were going well, to win. Well, they honestly forget. I okay. give them credit. Yeah. And but then, Frank Murphy of Cork, they say, his people used to criticise him, but he was ready for all emergencies. He had a spare cup downstairs in case of a man in wow. Barcelona. That's the cup that was presented to Christy Ryan. And a Cork, great Cork follower came with us. He used to always go to matches just in case, just in case Cork would win the day I wouldn't be there. He came with us and, of course, he was on top of the heaven. Coming back, we got a cart as they put it on him and sat him in the bonnet of the car going through Fermoy. <laughs> you wouldn't get away with that now. No. But we looked upon it, look, the game is over, the result won't change. Mick O'Dwyer's theory always was, let the winners enjoy their win. It doesn't change. Next year won't be long coming around and then he'll whisper, we're a bit ahead and more for next year. <laughs> you know, it was that casual. Yeah. But I thought it was great fun. Sometimes I think nowadays the enjoyment is taken out of it. You must be suffering, sort of. And, but um, there were good times. You, know? but you must meet a lot of the young players still around oh, the country. Yeah. You're at games. I've a good few of them today, you know. Well, they they're ordinary, nice, decent fellows. And they seem like they're enjoying it. So maybe the story they of the sacrifice... It, they're not enjoying it when they're together. Because they're, you know, being driven and you must do this. And they couldn't take a sip out of this without permission, you know. Their diet is controlled. Maybe it's a good thing, you know. But too much discipline and control. I don't believe a good player should be told going out in the field how he should play. The good player... Gauges the situation quickly and does generally does the right thing. Yeah, but things are changing, and it will be that way forever. But clearly, as somebody who trained the greatest or half the greatest um, yeah. uh, Gaelic football team of all time, you have thoughts on the game, and you would watch a game unfold, and you would see teams make mistakes. Would you diagnose that in commentary? Would you say that? Well, well I, you know, I'd say, you know, where the move went wrong, you know, as much as you could, and sometimes you wouldn't be absolutely sure, but you'd put it forward as a possibility. That for many years now, they didn't have anyone with you. Yeah. 
And I think sometimes, you know, the analysts, I, the time, I think the time for analysing a game is when it's over, not after five minutes. You know, that there's sometimes too much interruption with the play. What the followers wanted, the listeners of the audience, let it be television or radios, they want to know what is actually happening. Not, not missing some of it. But uh, commentaries are increasing, you know, in popularity and more channels now. There was only the RT yeah. that time. And you have any amount of them now. Who would have dreamt of that 50 years ago? Yeah. Well, or the phones being the, the next... Exactly. You've alluded to how GEA has changed for the player, but are you satisfied with how GEA has changed from a commentating point of view and from an analysis point of view? Well, from a broadcasting point of view, I used to always like to go to the dressing rooms, and I did, and it lasted while I was doing it. Uh, you know, free admittance, and you were welcome in dressing rooms. Pre-match. Pre-match. Yeah. Because a person could, I actually saw a person getting injured in the dressing room one day. Before a very important match, one of the famous four matches, Dublin and Meath in 1991. While I was talking to this fellow, he was changing into his playing clothes. And he got some sort of a spasm in his back and collapsed on the ground. And of course, Sean Boyle and his herbalist, didn't he? You know, and Jerry McIntyre, a team member, was a doctor. They put him on the table. And uh, when I went out, I was able to say that maybe such a person will take no part in the game. Yeah. And um, now it's the type of information that they guard yeah, jealously. You're not allowed, into, journalists nowadays are not allowed into the dressing room. And I think that's a, that's a pity in a way. I mean, there's no point in having locked in, in thought while they're in the dressing room. In their day, players were, were now, but even in those early days, it was common to see people smoking in the dressing yeah. room. Yeah. Wouldn't hear of it nowadays. Things have changed a lot, and a lot is for the better, really. You know. That was still in the 90s when I started going. You could still get in post-match. And oh, you could, yeah. There was a, a Wexford hurler who was like, lads, one of you has mentioned that I had a cigarette the last day. Don't do it again. I'm getting grief from my kids for it. So I think there was a, there was a, a, a joy <coughs> of, like, that's fine. Don't but the worry. player that collapsed was Terry Ferguson, a good player. They missed him that day, you know. And, uh, but uh, you, you'd learn a bit in the dressing room. Yeah. I always went down to see the bus arriving with the players just to look at them coming out of the ball. And you could read a lot into them. Like the horse in the parade ring. Exactly. You could read a lot into them. You'd know, you, you'd have an idea team that has winners written all over their demeanour, their behaviour. They're, they're cued into it. But then, the wonderful thing about it, you can be totally wrong. <laughs> a glorious and certainty I, of sport. I have seen... I suppose the, the strangest the game I remember most of all would be the Leinster hurling final of 1980. Now, Kilkenny, rainy All-Ireland champions, as there have been many a time since then, they were the champions, they were playing Offaly. And Offaly was simply nobodies. If you went back to 1969, they reached the Leinster final, but got nowhere. You have to go back to 1929 to find them in another Leinster fight. That's how far off the mark. They had never won a Leinster. And here they were in the fight. The attendance tells a story 9,300 and something at an event that usually do, drew over 30,000. Yeah. Olympic Games were on in Moscow the same day. But they beat Kilkenny that day. Now, it was the greatest sensation of all time, I'd say, in Hurley. Offaly, who had nothing, never reached a minor final before that. And here they were, Leinster champions. Not alone that, they went on to play in 11 consecutive Leinster finals and won seven of them. And in the 20 years that was left, in the century of the millennium, they won four All-Irelands. And no county could top that. 
I always call that a miracle. But I did witness it happen. I had a small little hint, but I didn't pay any heed to it. Uh, that e- the evening of the semi-finals, they beat Leash in the semi-final. I went into the hospital there in Adelaide Road, eye and ear, to see somebody that was in there with an eye injury. And a, an awfully player got an eye injury that day. I didn't know he was going to hospital. I, when I went in there, didn't I meet three of the awfully players? And we were talking usually about the match. And after a while, one of them said to me, you're talking a lot about Kilkenny and Wexford. Did you see us at all? I said, I didn't see much of you because while you were playing, I was over in the dressing rooms finding out all about the match I was broadcasting. And Paddy Delaney did say, don't roll us out now for the final. Now you'd feel like laughing, but you couldn't. <laughs> and uh, Paddy was a great friend of mine after, like all of them. But they did win, playing very good hardly. Mm. And the strange thing, the captain was Paddy Horden. Now, it was afterwards I heard the real story. After the game, he was the captain. He had to be interviewed. That would be the right thing. And I'd arrange for somebody that would waylay him and bring him up. And here I was interviewing him, maybe 15 minutes after the game ending. And the goalkeeper, Damien Martin, appeared at the door. And he was making all sorts of signals to me. And he was pointing at party and pointing at me. And I hadn't a clue what he meant. I thought he wanted to be included. <laughs> but it wasn't that word should come to Prok Park that Paddy Horden's father died. Oh, God. They wouldn't let him come to the match. He had a bad heart. Oh, no. And I think he should have been there because he had played for Offaly at his time. His son was captain. And I went down naturally to the funeral and all that, but I learned he was watch, listening to the game in, in the kitchen. And the grandchildren never that. It was getting very exciting towards the finish. Offaly was leading a little bit. And there was pandemonium and he, with the children. And he wasn't hearing it properly. And he said, I listened in the car. And he went out, sat into the car to, to have the rest of it in peace. Once it was over, they all dashed out and he was dead in the car. Right. So I said, now look, he was the first into heaven saying that Offaly had won the Lancer Championship. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was a distinction, and that was a good thing out of it. And there was a great funeral, all the hurlers came to it, and the Kilkenny fellas came and so on. Yeah. But they, went, they, they were great games. The same, I knocked a special kick out of when something happened that hadn't happened before. Yeah. Or that hadn't it happened in a long time. I know it's great when a county wins four in a row and all uh, that. We, we all love the underdog story, yeah, don't we? Yeah, but it's, it's uh, another world to win something. Like when Down won for the first time in 1960. They beat Kerry Hall, Rainey, All-Ireland champions. And to see the way they swore on the pitch. And then people, you speak a lot about the board at that time. You don't hear of the board yeah. at all nowadays. Well, maybe against The board. Soon. And the, the chant was... It's the first time that the Sam Maguire Cup will be carried across the border. That was a victory in its own to carry that across the border well, into County Down. And you can see then that they I got could the support see of the... The, the... There's always a place for the unexpected. Absolutely. And a big place. Michal, it's been a privilege spending time with you this morning. Thanks so much for talking to us slash afternoon. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks I enjoyed it.